good afternoon everyone uh, myself uh, dr s manikandan i'm working as a research assistant professor with the department of mechanical engineering saram institute of science and technology chennai so uh, in the five days uh, online fdp i am giving one lecture on uh, introduction to green energy commercial systems so let's uh, move on to the topic so uh, before starting the lecture so i wanted to uh, share the concept on negentropy right so everybody is concerned with the energy conversion and also the efficiency of the energy conversion systems so we will ponder on this uh, concept what is called as the negentropy okay um, in a book uh, what is life uh, which was written by erwin schrodinger he have written life speed on negentropy what exactly the negentropy is negentropy means the negative entropy entropy means uh, it is disorderliness negative entropy means uh, it is uh, ordered systems so let us assume the sun's energy that is the driving force or the energy source it means if it is an energy source it have more of negative entropy right so it is giving some amount of energy to the plants and the plants absorb the energy by photosynthesis and uh, it will give some fruits or leaves or anything so man harvest it and uh, some cases he will process it and he will eat it and that energy will allow him to do the work and he will think and he will produce some other works right which may be like in terms of writings or in terms of machineries or in the case of buildings which are ordered systems right so if we wanted to make anything any systems to be ordered we have to have some negentropy okay so in that case actually we have the primary energy source which is the sun which is supplying a uh, negative entropy to to everyone okay so with this i will start the lecture so um, why we need green energy conversion systems so like uh, as of now we are facing energy problems environmental problems as well as the economic problems which will be created because of the energy problem and the environmental problem right and you can see uh, the environmental problem will be created because of the um, thermal energy conversion systems or like we can say conventional thermal energy conversion systems as of now in india uh, we are utilizing almost 70 percentage of the energy sources like electricity which is coming from the thermal power plants okay and whenever we are burning the coal we are uh, producing some amount of carbon dioxide which will be harmful to the uh, surroundings right so and also like one more thing they like uh, we are running out of coal maybe like maybe in 20 30 years we will be running out of coal so we have to look uh, look into some other sources which um, may not uh, deplete with time okay so also like uh, as i said that the co2 emission problem there was a study which they have used the six different topologies for energy conversion or like say share of energy conversion systems so that which one will be beneficial to bring down the co2 emission in the environment okay in that you can see there will be like on all the six uh, shares like that is et ic ic engine bands less gas switch renewable energy push and uh, effective even faster transition and faster transition right okay in the case of even faster transition we will be pushing more amount of renewables into the uh, energy conversion systems share so that you can see the um, um, the carbon dioxide emission in something around after 20 years it will be reaching 1970s level okay that gives the very importance of why we need to push renewable energy into the market or like we can say green in green energy systems into the market so as to reduce the co2 emission that will in turn reduces the greenhouse um, effect right means like the global warming will be reduced further okay so as we said already uh, as erwin schrodinger said also like the sun is the primary source of energy so how exactly the sun is producing energy is because of nuclear fusion reaction which is taking place 
in the sun's ambient there will be hydrogen atoms that will be combined four hydrogen atoms that will combine into the helium atom in that process it will release some amount of energy in terms of million electron volt that is um, by fusion reaction right so um, that energy can be given as e equal to mc square and c is the velocity of the light and e is the uh, energy and m is the amount of mass reduced during this fusion process okay that means the mass is directly converted into energy but we can say during, during one fusion reaction will produce 25.7 million electron volt that even though that million electron volt is something around um, one electron volt is something around 10 to the power of negative 26 kilowatt hour that is very low so there will be more number number of enormous number of reactions which will be taking place in the sun's ambient that is giving rise to energy in terms of heat okay that will be propagated into the uh, outer space in the form of radiation so there was some study that uh, it's, min it's mentioned that um, if we put solar uh, solar photovoltaic systems into the sahara into 800 uh, square kilometers of uh, locations we can able to uh, uh, supply the whole electricity demand of the whole earth by from this 800 square kilometers if we put solar pv plant into the 800 square kilometer in the sahara desert but whether this option is good or not most probably actually people will think that it may be good but it is not good why it is not good because like uh, there will be the problem of uh, transporting the energy which is uh, converted into electricity at the sahara right so that is one one, one problem actually we have so what how we have to approach this problem is like we have to put the solar power plants which worth of 800 kilometer square area in the air anywhere in the air like in the distributor systems one kilometer once uh, one meter square in my home and another one meter square in my other like, like some different locations so that it will cover almost 800 square kilometers it can able to cater the electricity demand of the whole earth okay that much potential we have that much amount of solar radiation which is uh, incident on the air okay so we can rely on the solar energy for maybe like millions of years next to come uh, if we uh, bifurcate the amount of percentage of energy which is present in the solar spectrum so only, only seven percentage will be in the ranges of ultraviolet that is less than 380 nanometers and 47 percentage which will be in the visible spectrum visible spectrum means 380 nanometer to 780 nanometers that is uh, violet to the red and uh, other like in the form of heat radiation there will be infrared that is higher than 780 nanometers we will be getting something around 46 percentage of energy from the sun so we can utilize the solar energy in the form of light as well as in the form of heat that is what we wanted to uh, understand from this okay so we will look into some uh, conversion systems which will utilize the solar light as well as the solar heat to produce electricity as well as for some other applications okay so um, if we wanted to know like how much amount of energy which is coming from the sun we wanted to uh, know like uh, uh, in, in quantity like in numbers right? okay so for that uh, we call we, we have a constant which is called as the solar constant that says how much amount of energy which is received on the earth's surface or we can say the amount of solar power which is received on the earth's surface per unit time per unit area so that is something around 1367 watt per meter square meaning that thousand almost thousand watts of uh, power which is coming uh, are incident on the earth's surface okay almost right so if we can able to tap that for some uh, potential application we can replace uh, the conventional thermal power plants okay so um, but if we wanted to uh, keep like we have a uh, solar constant says that the, the amount of solar radiation above the earth atmosphere but once it reaches the earth atmosphere um, there will be some amount of losses which will be taking place and also it depends upon the location right and uh, the solar radiation depends upon time to time because 
in the early morning there will be sunrise by the time we will not be getting any effective or required amount of solar radiation right but in the case of noon we will be getting more amount of solar radiation so to understand how exactly the solar radiation differs with respect to the place and with respect to the time we need to study the solar angles okay so in that case uh, like as i have mentioned already there will be non uniformity of the solar radiation in the earth atmosphere as well as the above the earth atmosphere okay since the uh, orbit uh, of the earth around the sun is not uh, circular so there will be some non uniformity uh, there will be non non uniformity uh, in the solar radiation above the earth atmosphere also there will be non uniformity because of the cloud reflectance and uh, the uh, molecules present in the atmosphere that that will also create uh, some amount of losses in the solar radiation okay so air mass ratio is one of the concept actually like you can see in the morning time there will not be much amount of solar radiation because the the sun rays have to travel very long distance in the atmosphere right so that will be there will be more amount of losses and during the afternoon time there will be less amount of uh, the the path the distance to be traveled by the solar radiation will be low that is why actually more amount of solar radiation will be falling on the earth okay so air mass we, we have the concept air mass zero air mass zero means above the earth atmosphere that means there will be no atmosphere and air mass one is during the solar noon meaning that the sun is directly above our head and uh, if we know the incidence angle of uh, the solar radiation we can able to calculate the air mass okay so air mass equal to 1 by cosine of theta z theta z is the incident angle okay so uh, most of the solar energy applications they will take the standard as air mass of 1.5 that will corresponds to 1000 watt per meter square amount of solar radiation okay now this is alternate method how to calculate the uh, air mass ratio if we don't have the equipment so that we can if you put an object of uh, height 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 and if you know the shadow length at different times we can able to calculate the air mass ratio okay and uh, we know latitude and longitude yes uh, um so this is one of this is one of the important angles that will be used to calculate the uh, amount of uh, solar radiation will be falling on the surface okay um longitude may not be the prime uh, important but yes latitude will have prime importance okay the latitude which will bifurcate in the, the world not bifurcate actually it will um make into two different halves as northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere is the equator that we name it as zero degree zero degree so above which which we can it as call it as positive that is the north and or below the equator we call it as the south that is negative we can mention it. so there is another one important angle which is called as the declination angle declination angle is the angle at which uh, the solar radiation makes with the Uh, equatorial line okay so it will also differ because earth is tilted at 23.43 degree uh, degree so be because of that there will be a declination angle meaning that the there will not be um, uh, solar radiation will be falling always perpendicular to the earth or we can say to the equator always there will be an oscillation it will be between 23.43 degree north and 23 23.45 degree south okay or positive to negative 23.45 degree okay so um, there is one festival we call it as pongal that will uh, that what we call it as the welcoming of sun god welcoming of sun god it means it will happen during the um, when exactly it will happen you can see from here it will uh, january so during that time the um, sun will move from the negative uh, 23.45 to the north it means we are welcoming the sun okay for that occasion only what like that is the only hindu festival which will be uh, we will be celebrating in the 
uh, same date of the Julian calendar, right? Almost same date of Julian calendar. Why it is because we are welcoming the sun, and the sun will come from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere on the same date every year. Okay. So uh, there will be another angles like uh, elevation angle or the altitude angle that is theta E L. That is the angle made between the sun's rays and the horizontal plane. Okay. And similarly, the angle made between the sun's rays and the vertical axis that we call it as the zenith angle. The theta is it and uh, theta elevation and uh, there will be one more angle which will be called the azimuth angle azimuth angle is the angle which is made between we can say uh, north as, as, as the diagram says the angle between the north pole and the um, um, the shadow of this light which is falling on the ground okay that angle what we call it as the azimuth angle okay uh, in some books, actually, like um, this can be uh, uh, said as the angle made between the um, shadow of this uh, uh, so light, uh, the, the incident light, which is called coming from the sun and the so 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 southern pole. Okay, so that may be the azimuthal angle. So if we know the azimuth angle and the elevation angle, we can able to track the position of the sun at any location at any time. Okay. In the morning time the elevation angle will be zero in the afternoon the elevation angle will be high okay doesn't mean that the elevation angle will be 90 it will be 90 at on at different locations on only two days uh, even in the equator in two days only it will have make the elevation angle 90 okay in all other locations it will not make the elevation angle 90 during the solar month okay but it will be maximum during the solar month there is another angle which is what we call it as the hover angle. Hover angle means like the earth rotates uh, 360 degree in 24 hours. So how much uh, angle it will make in one hour, okay? That is 15 degree. So 15 into 24, we will get again in 360. So that's what we call it as the hover angle. So one hour, the earth will rotate 15 degrees, okay? That's what we call it as the hover angle. And at the solar noon, we assuming that it will be zero, and afternoon it will be positive and the morning it will be negative okay so um, we know that there will be uh, greenwich meridian time that is gmt and for that with that standard you know five hours 30 minutes will be we have to add it with the with that time so that we will be getting um, uh, indian standard time right so to calculate the indian standard time there should be a standard meridian Otherwise, you can see India lies something around. Uh, there will be two hours of time difference between the um, Gujarat and to the uh, northeast part of the India. Okay, um, but actually, we will be calculating. Uh, we will be using uh, an average time for this. So for that, we will be using um, uh, primary uh, one standard uh, longitude. That will be going to the Allahabad that is um, 82.5 degree east okay um, like uh, but in reality you can see if the sun is at the uh, 82.5 degree east latitude um, uh, the sun have crossed the northeast part of India right but the sun haven't crossed the Gujarat part but we'll be having the same time but as per the solar time, this uh, northeast is al almost one hour um, more actually. Or like we can say, the sun which will take one hour, of, the sun will come to Gujarat after one hour. Okay, so there will be difference between the standard time as well as the solar time. Okay, in all calculations to compute the solar energy, so we have to use the solar time. Okay, not the Indian standard time. Okay. So there will be a conversion to so how can we uh, um, calculate the solar time from the Indian standard time and vice versa, okay? So there will be uh, one term which will be called as the equation of time. The equation of time is also constant and that will be used to compute the um, one of the variable which is used to compute the um, solar time, okay? Um, 
So there are, will be different types of solar radiation. There will be uh, what we call it as the total radiation as G total. G total is, will be the sum of uh, beam radiation and the diffuse radiation. GB is the beam radiation and GB is the diffused radiation. Okay. So um, um, like uh, the beam radiations are the radiations which will be coming directly from the sun, which is not being diverted or not being deflected or not being reflected by any any of the aerosols or anything okay on the other hand the diffuse radiation will be uh, uh, scattered by the aerosols or clouds or anything okay so meaning that like if you put the your hand or anything in the beam radiation there it will form a, a, a proper shadow okay uh, with the proper border okay if you are putting your hand or anything on the diffuse radiation you will not be getting any shadow right so that is how you can differentiate the beam radiation and the diffuse radiation. So most of the solar um, photovoltaic systems actually, beam radiation and the diffuse radiation are okay. Like uh, they can able to generate some amount of power with beam and the diffuse radiation. But the solar thermal systems, um, also the concentrated solar thermal systems, which uses only the beam radiation, okay, to convert uh, the uh, solar light or solar heat into electricity or into the thermal energy okay but solar photovoltaics can able to utilize both beam radiation as well as the diffused radiation um, so like um, most of the applications in the uh, uh, like say example of uh, solar photovoltaic systems or solar thermal systems which will not be kept horizontal it will be tilted tilted okay with some angle beta so uh, we wanted to evaluate the radiation on the tilted surface as well okay for that we have equipments to evaluate so first one we call it as the pyranometer this, this will uh, calculate the um, total radiation or the global radiation what we call it as global radiation means the sum of um, beam radiation as well as the uh, diffused radiation okay so pyranometer will uh, measure the total radiation and there is another equipment what we call it as the fire heliometer that will uh, calculate the diffused radiation, uh, not the diffused radiation, direct radiation. So if we subtract the uh, readings we got, we get from the pyranometer and the fire heliometer, we can able to evaluate the diffused radiation. Okay. There is one more uh, uh, measurement we wanted to make, right? Uh, irrespective of the solar radiation, we wanted to know. How much time the sun stays, the sun's energy will be available to us, right? For that, we have the recorder, what we call it as the sunshine recorder. So this will calculate like how much amount uh, amount of time actually the sun is available on the particular location. Okay, so they will be having such kind of cards. You can see um, uh, in this last one, uh, there will be uh, the card is burned. Okay. For particular hours it means this much amount of time the sun is available okay but in the first card or the second card you can see the card hasn't burned much of the places okay meaning that the day is cloudy the sun is not available for most period of time okay only for particular amount of time actually here and here and here and here there was full sun okay there was no clouds okay so um, if we are putting solar thermal power plants, that is solar concentrated based thermal power plants, and um, if the day is on this, uh, this days, this kind of days, you will not be getting any amount of energy, okay? But instead, if you are getting, if you are having this kind of day, which is mentioned in the fourth figure, uh, fourth card, that will be the best possible day for the solar thermal power generation systems, okay? Uh, so this is for the uh, winter, that is for the uh, summer season, and this will be for the uh, equinoxial period, okay? As we mentioned early, like uh, India is also light in the tropical region, tropical region, so like we have more amount of solar energy resources, okay? So that we can able to tap uh, solar energy in the form of light as well as in the form of heat, so, so both the solar thermal systems and solar photovoltaic systems are best suited for our uh, country, okay? 
So I will give a very brief introduction about solar photovoltaics since we have another lecture on uh, solar photovoltaics in this FDP. So I will just touch upon the solar photovoltaic systems, okay? Photovoltaics means photo into light, that is uh, light to electricity, okay? So there will be advantages of this kind of systems, uh, also disadvantages of such kind of systems, okay? Say take the solar energy systems, it will be varying seasonally, yearly, days, hours, and per minutes actually, even per seconds actually, the solar energy will be uh, varied, okay? But say, say take example of geothermal systems or biomass based systems, uh, see, there will be seasonal variation only, okay? So maybe we will look upon solar, wind, uh, biomass, and geothermal systems in this lecture today. Uh, so like why I have mentioned this is like you can understand uh, what are the disadvantages of this kind of systems, okay? And this was the first solar cell which was uh, the three scientists with the Chapin, Fuller and Pearson and the Bell Labs, they have uh, discovered and uh, they have put this first solar energy cell, not the, this first, uh, first solar energy systems into the satellites. And this is how exactly the solar energy, solar photovoltaic systems works actually. When the light falls on the uh, semiconductor or silicon based solar cells, there will be energy electron hole pair generation and electron will move from um, conduction, conduction valency band to the conduction band by making a hole over here so that an electron will come over here, right? So um, this electron is like a heavy particle. So like uh, it have a lower energy state over here, okay? When compared to this, this conduction band, okay? So it will roll down here, but the hole is like a bubble in the water. So it will try to come to its lower energy state that is in the top. So there will be charge separation will take place. And because of the charge separation, there will be potential potential generated. And because of that potential, uh, there will be electron flow if we connect and load across it, okay? So if you put a, draw an equivalent circuit of the solar cell, this is the single diode model of the solar cell. We will have uh, a diode, a current source, a shunt resistance, and a series resistance. So we will be getting a characteristics like this, IV characteristics like this. There will be the four, four important points that we have to note is, or five or six important points, you can say, short circuit current, open circuit voltage, and maximum voltage, uh, um, maximum voltage at, uh, voltage at maximum power point, that is VMPP, and current at uh, maximum power point, IMPP, and fill factor, okay? It is the ratio of uh, maximum power divided by the open circuit voltage into the short circuit current, okay? If we wanted to compare different types of solar uh, PV panels, which is made of the same technology, so you can use the fill factor values. So if the fill factor value is high, you can opt for that panel, okay? If the fill factor is high, we'll be getting maximum power output, power output okay? However, if we have such kind of systems, like say, uh, the uh, power output from the solar uh, solar photovoltaic systems will be variable with respect to the solar radiation. See, if the radiation is 500 watts per meter square, the power output will be lower, okay? Um, if we connect a, a load like this, constant resistance load, okay? If the solar radiation is 1000 watts per meter square, it will be, the power will be almost doubled, okay? But if you have a single uh, load, that is a single resistive load, what will happen? If the solar radiation is constant at 1000 watt per meter square, the operating line, operating point will be over here, okay? However, the solar radiation, the, the power can delivered by the solar cell, power, more power can be delivered by the solar cell because maximum power point is over here, okay? If the solar radiation is uh, reduced, the operating point shifted from here to here, okay? But the solar panel can able to give more amount of power, okay? It is over here, okay? If we are not doing maximum power point tracking, we will be losing this much amount of power, okay? This will be, otherwise can be delivered by the solar cell, okay? We are not wasting that, okay? So for that only, we will be using maximum power point tracking techniques. So in that, we will be using a DC to DC converter. That will change the uh, resistance which is seen by the, um, solar cell okay even if the load resistance is fixed uh, the dc to dc converter resistance that will the duty cycle of the duty uh, 
DC to DC converter, it will change the resistance, which will be seen by the source. Okay, so that is how actually the maximum uh, we, we can alter the maximum operating point and thereby the maximum power point. Okay, so maximum power point tracking is one of the uh, important uh, concepts actually everyone should know if they are working with the solar photovoltaic systems. Okay. So there is another one problem, like if we are adopting the centralized electrical power system, that is uh, thermal power plants, because uh, the transmission losses is almost 60%, okay? Meaning that if you are consuming one unit at your home, that means three units of energy should be generated at the thermal power plant, okay? But instead, if you are using decentralized power systems by using the solar photovoltaic systems, you will be uh, generating one unit and you will be utilizing that one unit okay so you are reducing the amount of and coal which we are using so if we are reducing the amount of coal we are using we are reducing the carbon dioxide emission okay in that case so these uh, solar photovoltaic systems play a very important role in reducing the uh, transmission losses okay um, apart from that like we can use hybrid energy renewable uh, renewable energy systems that will have batteries, uh, uh, solar photovoltaic systems, fuel cell systems, and uh, wind generation systems, okay? So also like uh, we can have some diesel generator systems for backup, if not, not necessary. Otherwise, like we can integrate any other systems of uh, say like fuel cells also we can integrate, okay? So as I said, uh, there will be different climatic zones of India. Um, even if you are putting a solar photovoltaic plant in Tamil Nadu and the same technology, same power rating, if you are putting in the Rajasthan, the performance will be different because our climatic condition is different here and uh, Rajasthan, the climatic condition is different. Okay. So um, we have to choose carefully, like which kind of technology we have to uh, install in Tamil Nadu as well as in the Rajasthan. Okay. So see, see here. Um, in Tamil Nadu, actually, there will be less amount of uh, sandstorms, so there will be less amount of dust deposition. But if you are going to the, the Gujarat or uh, the Rajasthan, there will be more amount, of, more number of sandstorms, so like there will be more amount of dust deposition. Okay, this is one of the problem actually we have. So if we clean these panels often, that will make the surface rough, so that the transparency of the glass panel, the glass covers, will be reduced. That will in turn reduce the or output from the solar panels, okay? So for that, we come up with uh, this canal top solar power plant, uh, but actually like we, we, uh, we are not sure that whether this will serve the purpose of water evaporation, but exactly like we have more amount, amount more spaces actually, more space that can be covered, okay? So another interesting systems we come across is the solar floating power plant. So actually here, the dust deposition will be very much lower. And also, the temperature of the panel is lower. So, if the temperature of the panel is lower, the uh, panel will perform better. But the problem is how we will be uh, anchoring this kind of systems in a very big lake or big ocean or anywhere. Okay. And also, transmission of power from the um, uh, floating systems to the uh, shore that is another problem we have. Okay. So now people are doing some research on this to. Um, improve the reliability of such kind of systems okay so now we will move on to solar thermal systems so like there will be two types of solar thermal systems that is um, uh, heating systems as well as the power generation systems okay first we look into the heating systems heating systems there will be two that will be thermosiphon based thermosiphon based means like we can able to uh, utilize our heat uh, use this hot water and the hot water will be circulated uh, naturally because of the density differences, okay? As we know that uh, um, uh, if the temperature of the fluid increases, what will happen? If density decreases, if, the, if its density decreases, the cold fluid is having higher density, will try to come over there. So that is how exactly the thermosiphon collector works, okay? Or if you wanted to have uh, need higher temperature output, so people, you can go for active thermal collector systems. It means you'll be having a pump uh, so that there will be a proper flow of uh, fluid so that you can get your temperature, 
uh, required temperature okay if you are adjusting the mass flow rate you can able to adjust the temperature of the fluid okay another interesting application of uh, the solar is uh, solar cooker okay so you can able to cook uh, free of cost because you are not using any amount of electricity over here okay also it is non polluting but the problem is longer cooking hours okay limited varieties of dishes you can do you could not able to do frying or frying you could not able to do frying okay so and also the solar availability is intermittent like whenever you are start cooking by the time there will be more amount of sun but once you uh, like it is half cooked by the time if there is no availability like there will be a problem right so solar availability is intermittent and also if it is taking too much of time that will not be very much of useful right that is why actually this uh, box type solar cookers are not very popular in india even though india is in tropical climate conditions okay so to address this issues actually uh, we have concentrated type uh, solar cooker so what exactly here is we will be concentrating the solar light onto a small space and on the small space actually will be we can put the uh, cooking vessels so that uh, the heat will be it will be the temperature uh, temperature will be higher so that uh, uh, we can cook uh, effectively and easily and fast okay so this will be the advantage of this this solar uh, concentrating based collector uh, have the advantages but the problem is like this will not work if it is cloudy okay that is another problem we have all right so if we we can able to improve these systems but there will be always some limitations we have okay um also like we can use the solar radiation for uh, drying the crops but uh, there will be like uh, you you can you can see in, in the villages actually will be uh, open drying the uh, food items or whatever the case is or like but look at look into this if you are doing an energy balance um, there will be heat absorbed for sure but there will be more amount of losses which will be taking place because the wind is uh, blowing that will be carrying the um, heat which will be absorbed by the crops okay and there will be some conduction heat losses to the ground so the drain will not be so much of effective or like you can say there will be bird droppings there will be problem of bird that will be taking the food crops okay so to avoid such kind of things like there will be a solar dryer in that uh, we can put the uh, food items which to be dried into the chamber or like we can preheat the air and then you can dry in batch wise okay these are the some applications and also like we can say we can produce some amount of uh, water from the uh, brain or like uh, waste water so this works on the principle of uh, vaporization and condensation okay so here the water is getting heated the, the waste water is getting heated and it evaporates over here and it will condense over here and if it condenses the water vapor will have uh, the the air which will have less amount of water vapor so that will come down here and it will stay the water vapor and it will move here it will circulate again and again meaning that it will take the water vapor and here it will condense and it will come down and it will circulate again and again so in that process we will be getting some amount of water okay and uh, in the case of solar pond uh, this this is another application of uh, solar energy systems so in the pond actually we can see we will always see in the normal pond the top layer of the um, pond is heated but bottom it will not be heated right it will be cold but in the case of solar solar pond it is exactly opposite the top surface which will be at the ambient ambient condition and if you go deeper we will be having higher the temperature okay um, that will be maintained artificially okay how we are maintaining that temperature there higher temperature there because we will be varying the density of the fluid okay so we will be putting high density fluid over in the bottom and uh, there will be some density gradient over here and there will be uh, ordinary water over here okay so we can see that you how we are varying the density we are putting uh, more salt okay here we are putting more salt so that see assume that if uh, the, um, the water is getting heated over here it will have lower the density but the other, the above layer 
which will have a lower density than this layer which is even it is at higher temperature okay so there will not be no circulation of the fluid okay if there is no circulation what will happen more amount of heat will be getting accumulated over here okay so if we can able to um, recover that amount of heat which is from the solar cell we can able to uh, like uh, run the power plant uh, by using the organic working fluid because we are not able to uh, maintain more than 120 or 150 degrees celsius okay so in that case uh, we could not able to evaporate water to run the turbine so in that case we'll be using some uh, fluids binary fluids that will have a uh, uh, boiling point uh, very lower and uh, that can able to build up some pressure so with that we can use the run the turbine okay so uh, we can generate power from the solar pond as well okay so as we already told that there will be different types of solar concentrator systems the there will be parabolic trough linear frontal and the point concentration system and the line focusing systems the top two are the line focusing systems and the bottom two are the point focusing systems okay uh, depending upon the applications actually like uh, we can use the central receiver power plants will work on point focus system or the linear tunnel systems or the parabolic trough will work on the uh, line concentrating systems okay this uh, this point concentration based concentrate Compound, uh, not compound parabolic, paraboloidal systems which will use the uh, Stirling engine to produce uh, some amount of power. Okay. Um, there will be systems like uh, with thermal energy storage and without thermal energy storage. Okay. Why we need thermal energy storage? See, suppose say uh, this will be the capacity we need, and uh, the solar radiation can able to give that much amount of uh, heat that will be useful but there will be more amount of solar radiation which will be available during the morning time okay so what we will do is that so what we can do is we can uh, store this excess amount of solar radiation so that uh, like um, at this time this, there will be no sun there will be no sun but the energy which will be stored from the afternoon that will capture some amount of load for some period of time okay even if it is spending six, um, six, six hours, that will be beneficial because we will not be using fossil fuels for that, treatment, that much of time, okay? That will be very much beneficial, okay? But the problem is, uh, this kind of systems will be very much costly uh, because we, uh, it will also occupy more amount of space because um, more volume of heat to be, uh, more amount of heat to be stored, okay? So there will be two types of systems which can have the storage as well as no storage okay i think uh, th there will be uh, modes of tracking systems we have because uh, as we have already told that the sun's position will be varying with respect to the time so we need to have tracking okay to track the sun's position this will be mostly uh, useful or compulsory in the case of solar concentrating systems for the non concentrating systems the tracking is not very much necessary okay because in the case of tracking systems we need the direct light so direct light is available in the direction of the sun okay so suppose if you are putting a solar power plant solar pv power plant and uh, we can compare the power output during the fixed axis single axis and the dual axis we can see the dual act, the tracking will improve the amount of power output from the solar panels right um, but however there will be not much improvement in the um, uh, single axis and the dual axis okay but the cost involved from the single axis to the dual axis will be more okay that is why actually people are not very much interested in going for dual axis solar tracking systems okay there is one another tracking systems what we call it as the biannual tracking systems um, suppose say uh, in the summer actually we know the sun will be above our head and during the winter the sun will be further deeper into the southern hemisphere okay meaning that there will be uh, the altitude angle during the noon during the winter and summer will be different okay so instead of having a fixed tilt in the solar um, systems actually we should have uh, um, during the winter actually we can have latitude minus 15 
and in the summer if we have the hills latitude plus 15 we can have a uh, higher power output okay you can see from here uh, this was a research study done at iit kharagpur so you can see um, from april to september if you are putting latitude minus of 15 um, the, the it can able to fetch more amount of uh, solar radiation right but from october to March, if you are putting latitude plus 15, that is more tilted towards the south, so we will be getting more amount of uh, solar radiation. Okay, so this proves that like uh, this, this doesn't need uh, much of daily tracking, so this need only two adjustments. Okay, uh, only seasonal, once in six months. Okay, even with that case, we can able to improve such uh, some amount of solar radiation will be falling on the solar panels that will improve the overall power output of the system okay so whenever uh, next time if you are going for uh, solar pv installations if you are not you know, if you could not able to afford the uh, solar uh, dual axis or single axis tracking systems you can go of course go for the biannual tracking systems okay and uh, there's, there's another one application for the solar cooling uh, solar photovoltaic systems you can uh, operate the uh, vapor compression refrigeration systems that is uh, our air conditioners and the fridge which will be working on the vapor compression refrigeration systems uh, we can run it with the solar uh, photovoltaic panels okay uh, by changing the compressor or like we can put an uh, intelligent inverters over there okay so in that case actually we will not be using the conventional uh, electricity to run the uh, to cool the spaces okay this is another application of uh, solar systems okay now we will move on to the wind energy conversion systems so we have to know how exactly the wind occurs uh, we know the sun will move in the equatorial region plus 23.45 and minus 23.45 so in this cases actually this region will be warm when compared to the poles okay so here the Density of the air will be lower, here the density will be higher. So the air will, will try to move from here to here, okay? That is how exactly the uh, wind occurs, okay? So for the wind also, the primary energy source is the sun because that is heating the air uh, at uneven places, okay? Uneven, okay, at different places, okay? So that is how exactly the wind uh, is getting generated. And there will be equipments to measure the wind directions and uh, the wind speed. So, anemometer we used to, to measure the wind speed and the wind vane, which will measure the uh, or which will say which direction the wind is blowing. Okay, this two data is very much important for setting up a, a wind power plant. Okay, there is one more uh, data which is uh, like uh, all these two data, which they will be plotting it in the form of wind rows, which will give us that. Um, how much amount of time the uh, uh, the wind speed is higher and also in which direction okay that wind rose diagram will be very much beneficial for any power plant center so this will give us the which direction the wind speed is more and uh, during which time and how much frequency uh, that wind speed had occurred okay how much amount of time that that wind speed had occurred okay so also like we can see this is the variation of wind speed with height and the power output from the wind is like a p output from the wind will be equal to half rho a b cube okay rho is the density of the air and a is the area the soft area of the uh, blade or like we can say of the turbine and uh, v is the velocity so if the velocity is uh, uh, doubled we will be getting almost eight times okay eight times improvement in the power right? because the velocity cubed okay so that is the reason actually like uh, we, we like uh, we'll be setting up different uh, um, wind turbines at different heights okay if we increase the height you can able to increase the power by three times okay or not by three times actually you can say cubed okay so that is why actually we'll be measuring the wind speed at different heights. So we'll be putting the mast at uh, 100 meters level and we'll be measuring the potential at 100, 120, 150 meters height also, 
okay this maps will be available with the national institute of wind energy that can be accessed by everyone okay so this kind of technology we have and this is the basic uh, energy conversion systems actually which will have the aerodynamic aspects because of the turbine and after that it will have the mechanical aspects because we have to convert that uh, we, we make the a turbine rotates for that we need the aerodynamic design we need uh, lower the drag and higher the lift and then the mechanical aspects will come here actually we have to convert the slow rotation into higher rotation and that will be coupled to the generator and it will produce the mechanical energy into electrical energy and then we will be needing a power electronic converters that will be connected to the grid okay there will be two types of systems horizontal axis and vertical axis uh, whatever the systems will be, we need uh, all these systems like uh, from the aerodynamic aspects and the mechanical aspects and the electrical aspects. We have to design these systems. Okay, so I think we have one lecture uh, on the wind energy conversion system. So I will not go much into details of this. Okay, then I will look into the ocean thermal energy conversion systems. So ocean thermal energy conversion systems, we will be tapping the uh, temperature differences which will be present at the top of the uh, ocean and the almost at 700 to 800 meters of the ocean okay so as we go deeper into the ocean there will be a temperature gradient something around 25 to 30 degrees not 30 degrees you can say 20 to 25 degrees so if we can able to utilize this uh, temperature difference to make uh, water or uh, some fluid not not water some other binary mixture to evaporate and with that we can run the turbines okay from there with that we can able to run the generator and thereby we can able to produce some amount of power okay so in the case the evaporator will be taking the water from the uh, uh, like uh, from the top of the ocean and it will evaporate the fluid and once the fluid uh, make the turbine rotate and then it have to move to the condenser and the fluid will be condensed by using the cold water which will be taken from the depth of the ocean okay so that is how exactly the evaporate that uh, fluid will be evaporated and then condensed and then it will be pumped again and then it will be evaporated and uh, cycle circulate again and again okay so there may be different types that is onshore and the offshore onshore means it will be setting up on the uh, shore so that we, we need a pumping station over there or like we can if we are setting up in the offshore uh, the problem is like uh, transporting the uh, electricity to the shore okay but in the case of onshore the problem will be pumping the water from the cold water from the deep of the ocean to the shore okay in the both cases there will be challenges but actually this is one of the technology we can have in the future okay and the geothermal energy conversion systems so um, geothermal, in the case of ocean, there will be potential uh, the temperature difference in the uh, depth of the ocean. But in the case of geothermal systems, in the case of geothermal systems, we will be having potent uh, temperature differences in the air. Okay. So there will be some locations. Uh, if we go deep into the air, not much deeper, one or two uh, meters into the air, so there will be. Uh, much of temperature like something around you'll be getting something around 100 to 150 degrees Celsius okay so in that locations if you can able to put some amount of water that will be uh, you can get some amount of water vapor and that heat will be uh, used to uh, run the turbine and then you will be recirculating the water again to cool that water and condense it and then you'll be injecting it again to the ground and from there you'll be uh, getting the water vapor and then again running the uh, turbine okay this can be done with uh, organic rankine cycles or also like if the temperature is much higher we can able to go with the water or the working fluid okay there are another applications for geothermal energy conversion like we can have uh, um, uh, air, the air tunnel heat exchanger or borehole heat exchanger or we can see um, during the winter climatic conditions like the left of the figure um, you can run the fluid, you can put the fluid you know, down to the earth and that will get heated up and that, will, and that heat will be uh, um, 
radiated to the living space okay that thereby heating the ambient okay or like in the case of uh, cold climatic and uh, the hot climatic condition the ground temperature will be a little bit lower actually this will not be for coming for the geothermal energy conversion but yes but um, in some locations we can able the atmospheric temperature will be higher than the ground temperature okay in that locations this will be useful okay and this will be used for geothermal uh, heat pumping applications okay to heat the space and also in spain actually uh, like they have a device test system which will be using the thermoelectric generators to um, 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 to take the waste heat from the um, ground and uh, uh, that heat will be used to convert the uh, heat will be converted into electricity by using the thermoelectric uh, generators okay there is a, this is a heat pipe and that heat pipe will be put into the geothermal stations there exactly the uh, uh, the heat will be transported from below to the thermoelectric generators and that the ambient it will be at lower temperature so there will be a temperature difference between the hot and the cold side so from there it can able to produce some amount of electricity by using the Peltier effect okay this uh, technology is being patented in patented in spain okay and uh, thermoelectric energy conversion this is also a uh, heat to electricity conversion system uh, if we have the temperature differences at uh, uh, between two dissimilar materials, N type and P type, and we will be getting some amount of potential if we connect connect uh, load resistance across that. Okay, so um, thermoelectric devices are the thermoelectric generator which will be useful in harvesting the waste heat. Okay, that waste heat may be from the cook stoves or from uh, any power plants or from the IC engines. Also, body heat uh, recovery also, we can able to use the thermoelectric generators. Also, like we can use the thermoelectric generators to uh, recover some amount of heat and also to produce power from the solar light, okay? Um, say if we have a collector like this and uh, we'll be heating, the sunlight will be falling on this and it will be getting, getting heated. And that hot fluid will be stored here and uh, we'll be putting a thermoelectric generator over here and uh, we'll be putting another tank that will be circulating the cold fluid so we can have a temperature difference between the hot side and the cold side so that will generate some amount of electrical power okay so by using this uh, solar thermoelectric uh, solar uh, solar energy we can able to generate some amount of power by using the thermoelectric generator systems okay there is another research which will be um, uh, done by mit usa so they have uh, used the optical concentration as well as the thermal concentration systems so that uh, they concentrated the solar light onto the thermal uh, hot side of the thermoelectric generator thereby the temperature was higher over here and they have put the um, sink or the cold side at some temperature that is something around 300 kelvin so there will be a potential difference across, uh, temperature difference across the hot side and cold side thereby they have uh, um, uh, got the efficiency of the energy conversion as 1.4 percentage that is very much higher okay and uh, so in this case it's also like we can use the thermoelectric power generations uh, for uh, with solar also okay and wearable thermoelectric devices also like we know our body is uh, at temperature 36 degrees always so uh, there may be uh, ambient which will be higher lower temperature than our body yes so in that case if we are uh, uh, putting the uh, thermoelectric devices in our body so our uh, there will be some potential potential which i am saying is the temperature because that is the driving potential for the energy conversion here so um, there will be a temperature difference between the hot and cold side so thereby it can able to generate some amount of voltage that can able to drive some sensors or some watches okay these kind of systems are available wearable thermal devices okay okay not the least uh, like i will move on to the biomass energy conversion systems so we could not able to say biomass as the 
um, green energy conversion systems, but we can say carbon neutral systems. Why we call it as the carbon neutral? Because while burning this uh, biomass, we will be getting some amount of uh, carbon dioxide, right? Carbon will be emitted when we are doing uh, or directly doing combustion, okay? But um, the uh, if the plant is alive, what will happen is like it will uh, while doing photosynthesis, it will absorb the carbon dioxide and it will emit the oxygen. So it mean mean meaning we will assume that like uh, amount of carbon dioxide uh, absorbed and released uh, will be equal. Okay, so that is why we call it as the carbon neutral. Okay, for this also biomass also the primary energy, primary energy will be the sun because the uh, organic content uh, which will be created because of the photosynthesis okay so this will be the types of um, energy conversions like if you are using the uh, biomass like say we can produce uh, we can uh, do uh, thermochemical processes or biochemical processes or agrochemical processes okay say in the case of photosynthesis we will be getting uh, organic matter that will be used for combustion Okay, or if we, you can go for thermal thermochemical route, that is by direct combustion, or you can densify it and then do do the combustion, or liquefaction, or pyrolysis, or gasification, or like biochemical processes, you can go for alcoholic fermentation. You'll be getting the ethanol, and you can run the engine by using the ethanol, or you can go for anaerobic digestion. You'll be getting the biogas, and you can burn the biogas by in the engine and you can able to get the mechanical energy and then run the alternator then you will be getting the electrical energy okay or uh, anaerobic digestion simply you can get the heat and also biophotolysis you can able to get the hydrogen uh, or like you can do the biophotolysis and you can extract some amount of fuel and instead of oils also you can use you to run the engine okay so I will not much go much details into that, uh, but actually there is one important uh, thing is like uh, these are getting popular nowadays, the densification of the uh, fuels, organic content, okay? So um, why we need densification? Because actually biomass, uh, we have uh, varieties of biomass. One will have like say the leaves and barks or the branches of the trees. The same, the leaves will burn faster but the branches will the will uh, burn slower okay so but and also like say if you have paper that is another one organic waste or uh, like that will different burn at different rate okay so however what we will do is if you uh, mix all these things and uh, um, uh, densify it so what will happen is like you can make it in the form of pellets so that will have uh, higher uh, uh, density and it will have it will burn for longer the time okay so there will be uh, different types of uh, briquettes that can be made from the sawdust wood shavings shredded straw or shredded paper cardboard mahogany pine mdf also so like uh, this, uh, this can be used for uh, cook stoves also See, like say in the, in, the, in the cases of villagers, we still be using the uh, biomass, okay? But um, see, more amount of um, pollution will be created because if you are, if you are not densifying it and um, using it, okay? Because more particulate matter will be um, released. However, if you are densifying it, there will not be, not, not, the, 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 this will, uh, this will burn for more the time so that there will be less amount of particulate matter will be emitted okay um, that what we can say that is a form of clean combustion okay still it is not clean um, but yes we can say it as a clean combustion okay for that we need uh, we the process will be how we will be taking the raw materials and we will store it and if it is wet we have to dry it and then we will be grinding it, okay, so that it will be uh, mixed uh, in particular fashion, and then we will be putting a uh, powdered material, and then we will be uh, 
put some chemical to uh, make it bond or like uh, make it um, attached together and then we will densify it then cool it and then we will bricket it and we will pack it and we will sell it okay there is one um, subsidiary of uh, thermax that is urja urja stoves actually they will be they they, they are selling the uh, cook stoves uh, which uh, will run on the brickers okay they will be selling the brickers also they will be selling the stoves also okay um, that is pretty clean actually in combustions okay i think uh, with this i will stop the, the lecture and uh, if you have any other queries actually you you are always welcome to contact me i think i have given my uh, uh, email in the beginning itself like uh, you can write to me always uh, on on this uh, renewable energy systems or wind energy systems or solar photovoltaic energy conversion systems okay we will be very happy to help thank you